Okay, got it. All right, did you guys all get the little recording in progress? Beep boop? Yes. yes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just kind of introduce ourselves, uh, leadership team and uh, the first gen generation student group. The chair is Laura. If you just heard her speaking, so I don't know if you want to hop on and say hi, Laura. Yeah, I will. Here, it's just a little bit dark in the house. <laughs> no reason. <laughs> on. Hello. <laughs> All right, then I'm the vice chair. My name's Erin Robinson. Um, I'm not sure if Samantha is with us this evening. She is our blog editor. I do know Rebecca is here. She is our webmaster. I don't know if you want to say hi, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. And then Caitlin Price is our secretary. Um, our faculty advisor is Dr. Anthony Bernier, and he is here too. I don't know if he wants to pop on and say hi. I will pop off and say hi. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi. Glad you're here. I'm, I'm excited to, to uh, have the have everybody interview you. And um, uh, I'm broadcasting live from, uh, from Oregon on the other side of the country. Glad you're here. And then I just also wanted to let everybody know that's in attendance. We do have an opportunity to join our leadership team for our social media coordinator position. Um, feel free to e email us a statement of interest um, to our email address. Thank you. And then let's see. So tonight's agenda, just to go over with, um, we welcome and introduced our leadership team. Our interviewee is Dr. Rufina Ozu. She's a lecturer at San Jose State High School. And then we're going to um, follow up some, a question and answer session. And then we're going to have some closing remarks. Go back. And just to introduce our guest interviewee, uh, Dr. Rufina Ozo. She is a lecturer for San Jose State University. She started in 2013. She has her PhD in organization and management with specialization in information technology management from Capella University in 2007. She got her MSLS, uh, Library Science and Information Studies from Clark Atlantic University in 1994. And she got her bachelor's in library and information science with a minor in English from the University of Nigeria in 1989. Welcome, Dr. Ozo. Thank you so much. And um, we'll start the interview. Um, what was your experience through school as a first generation student? Okay, when I was at Clark Atlanta University, actually luckily for me, I didn't come as a student straight from Nigeria. That's the experience you're needing to know, like my experience as like a foreigner, is that um, I wanna make sure. The first, like, first person in your family to go to school, um, to go to, like, a master's program, a PhD program. Okay, okay. Well, I really have to say that I apologize. I didn't quite understand it that way. I don't know what I was thinking. So I really apologize. I wish oh, I had no need, need to apologize. I, I wish I had caught it earlier because I'm really not a first generation student. For real, I don't know what I was thinking because my dad was a professor in a university. Were you the first generation to to um, attend school here in the United States? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. That's 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 your experience. Yeah, that would be your experience as well, yes. Okay, exactly. Okay, very good. So I did not come in directly from Nigeria to study in the U.S. I came in to start a family with my husband. And then within three months, I enrolled at Clark Atlanta University to study for my master's in library science. And I tell you, you know, Coming into a new country, never studied in the U.S., 
it wasn't such a big cultural shock because my dad was a professor of geology at the University of Nigeria, which is quite reputable. But then again, I was in a new country. So it can be intimidating because, of course, Clark Atlanta is somewhat just a little bit um, bigger than my university in Nigeria. And the accent of the professors, because I was still trying to unravel the maze. So the accent, actually, sometimes I will want to like record the professors with the cassette recorder. You know, I don't know if any of you is even um, familiar with that. So sometimes I'll take a cassette recorder to the classrooms to record the professors because of the accent. So that and also, um, you know, the anxiety of not really knowing anybody, which is of course the situation for most people to, that go to school in a new environment. So the anxiety of that, not having friends, being intimidated in a new country, like I said, the accent too. So those were the major problems that I had. So. Were you still able to um, like keep in close contact with your family while you were out here? Yes, of course. And of course, I was living with my husband. So okay. I had family. Like I was saying, some students will come in fresh from, let's say, Africa to the U.S. So my experience is, is a little bit different from them, even though I, I still had challenges. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I was able to go through school okay. I'll record my professors and then I'll seek support from the other Americans. And, you know, I had to get into the habit of going to the college library to study. So I kind of feel that then I was doing more than the other people because, you know, because I was new and had a few challenges. How how would you say the the education system was different here in the U.S. as opposed to Nigeria? To be honest with you, it's not that much different. Like the University of Nigeria was started as far back as on 1960, very very developed, and I had the opportunity that my dad was a professor, a highly placed professor. So we lived right on campus. You know, like in Nigeria, they will have the faculty, the, the faculty residents were right on campus, like in the middle of the campus. Wow. So, you know, I pretty much grew up living on campus. So in I can only say it may be a little different because the US, of course, they have more technology like the electronic resources. We didn't have it that much over there, even though in 1993, when I went to Clark Atlanta, I mean, the technology, it wasn't at, that advanced either because we were using CD-ROMs to pull up ProQuest, to pull up articles. And I worked at the periodicals department at the Robert Woodruff Library. So then faculty and students were still using the paper journals, magazines and journals. So we will pull the physical journals for the faculty and students and sometimes the CD room will have the articles too. That was just when electronic resources were developing. The internet hadn't started really then. Anyway, so in terms of the difference, I can say that of course the US in terms of having more sophisticated tools um, in that area, you know, 
it was different. Mm -hmm. And our, our, our next question is, looking back, what challenges did you face as a, a first generation student here in the United States? Okay, like I said earlier, the accent was a major challenge. So I had to record my professors in some situations. And of course, to a foreigner, foreigners tend to believe that Americans talk fast. So actually that was the reason why I had to record them because, you know, to me, they were speaking too fast. So my recommendation to universities, to libraries will be to be, to be patient with new students and for the professors and librarians to speak slower when they're engaging with their students or, or patrons. And then I don't even recall that we were given any bibliographic instruction like to teach the freshmen how to use the college resources more efficiently. So it was kind of a challenge to me because I had to do like double the work to be able to find the resources that I needed or like the people that were already, you know, familiar with the system. So that would be my recommendation to, you know, faculty and library staff to be patient with new students from another country to talk slower and to maybe even create the body system where you body them up with other students to help them to be able to navigate the new culture better. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's like every question I have leads into what you just got done saying. Um, <laughs> Do you have any advice that would be beneficial for a first generation student for the iSchool program and beyond into the fields? Because you have extensive experience with the public library system. Yeah, well, um, the advice for the iSchool, of course, um, the first generation students to make sure that they are giving more um support because if you don't give them more support they may be discouraged and they may drop out so first of all will be to interview them if the school is able to identify those students interview them to see what could be done to make their experience um seamless um, so that will be my advice. And, you know, to provide, you know, just explain things that can help them, the university, library, or the department, just to make sure that they explain things better for them and not take it for granted that, oh, just like the other students, they are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That's something we talk about quite often within our group too, is just like how, if you're not a first gen, you might have the advantage of, of somebody being able to, you know, guide you in how to do research and how, how the best ways to study and things like that. And if you're the first one in your family, um, then you might not know these things. And if there's nobody on the campus or no programs to show you how, I didn't learn to use the library on my undergraduate campus until my third year when a very kind professor took me to the library and showed me how to use it properly. <laughs> okay, right, see? Yeah. see? yeah, so a major one will really be to, um, first of all, identify those people, interview them, find out what the school can do to make the experience pleasant, seamless, you know, just so that they're able to graduate and not just graduate and encouraging their family members. Oh, it was a great experience. It wasn't really as hard as I thought it was going to be. They were very welcoming. 
they kept on, you know, contacting me to see if I was doing okay. They made sure that I was um, familiar with the library resources because making sure that students understand the library and how to um, take advantage of the library, it's really major. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the high school really does a very good job. I tell you, um, the high school really stands out because I mean, as a professor, they will ask us if somebody is falling behind or not, you know, not participating weekly, let us know so that we can reach out to the person and make sure things are going okay. Personally, I normally do that with my students when they miss a few discussions, I'll send an email to them. Oh, I hope everything is going okay. And if they tell me that they have issues, I mean, I will immediately accommodate them. Mm -hmm. And I think- That's very generous, sorry. Yeah, oh, that's okay. I was gonna say another thing that was really great as a first gen coming into the high school was the 203 course that we have to do. Um, <clears throat> I think it's 203, it's the small course and it takes you through everything with like how to navigate the library and how to use um, like the proper search functions and the advanced search and like how to do all these different things. And like, that was so helpful because I, especially like for more than one reason, because I was a first gen, it was a new university and I was coming from a physical university to an online one. So having that resource, um, especially as a first gen and not really having anybody to say, hey, how did you do this when you were in school? Um, mm -hmm. It was incredibly helpful. So I totally agree that the iSchool does a really good job at like facilitating those, those things that you might not know how to do on your own. Yes, and another thing is maybe creating the body system. I don't know if the high school has that already because some students, I mean, another challenge, not just being first gen, they are intimidated about the online schooling platform. So that's another challenge. So maybe identifying the students that are already that have been in, you know, they have taken a couple of classes and did well, maybe body them up with first gen so that they can explain to them things that they did, the challenges they had themselves and how they were able to handle the challenges. So I think a body system will be great. That's actually a really good idea. and. I think maybe we should make a note, even if we can implement some kind of like, you know, mentee mentor, even yes. within the first gen group. And, you know, so if somebody's looking for, for some help, then we can hook them up with somebody else who might be able to um, yes. kind of guide them through. That's, that's a really excellent idea. Yes. Yeah. And our group has been a really good platform for bouncing ideas are people saying, Hey, you know, I'm kind of struggling with this and just kind mm -hmm. of being a sounding board, which has been beneficial for me and I know for others as well what's been nice yes yeah. and then I have one last question in the interview okay. um, how did you develop how did you develop your teaching and leadership skills okay mine came really easy luckily for me my mom my mom was and I'm elementary school teacher. My dad was a college professor. So it's almost like I joined in the family business, which is teaching. So I already have those skills just because my parents, even um, one of my sisters was a teacher also. Anyway, so it came naturally to me and also, I'm very passionate about helping people, about just teaching people things. And, you know, leadership, it is something that I enjoy doing. I worked at the Gwinnett County Public Library um, over 10 years ago. I was the head of the Reference and Information 
um, services department. And I had the opportunity of supervising 14 information specialists. And even before then, when I was an information specialist, I was supervising the shelvers, you know, the high schoolers. After that, then I was promoted to supervise 14 information specialists. And then after that, I became a branch manager. And after that, currently I'm an assistant director. So I have just continued to develop my skills by reading professional journals, by going through training sessions. And also, I think I have leadership in myself too, you know, being the leader of my family in, in terms of the children, raising them. So all of those um, contributed to where I am right now. Building blocks. That makes yes. sense. Yes, yes. Were there any kinds of um, like leadership programs that you found particularly helpful? Like as you were taking like training along the way? Because I know that there's like, in one of my courses we were learning, there's so many different like kinds of training that you can go through now. And they're introducing lots of like um, EDI training and things like that. Um, so yes. I'm just wondering if anything stuck out for you. Um, well, I'll say the the leadership trainings I took through um, Niche Academy and just several webinars that I have had the opportunity to attend throughout you know, my career. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can say the ones from Nisha Academy, which are the ones stands out? You know, the regular leadership um, opportunities given by library systems during staff development, sometimes somebody from the outside will be brought in to, you know, train staff. So you know, I've just had the opportunity to go through a lot of, um, you know, training sessions here and there. Yeah. And I think, too, like, the leadership is one of those things where, like, the training and the and taking courses can be very helpful to kind of hone your skills, but it definitely takes the experience. And, like, it sounds like you kind of, you had, like, one level of leadership mm -hmm. and then you took on the next level and the next level mm -hmm. and so I think that's like a really important thing when it comes to like developing yourself as a leader so I, that makes a lot of sense to me <laughs> exactly for, for me for the most part that's how we really worked out from for me from supervising shelvers high school students to inform 14 information specialists and then being a branch manager, supervising the whole branch, and then as an assistant director, and like I said, you even the one in the home, being a leader in the home, in the family, you know, guiding your children, all of those, you know, helped me. That's really I have cool. a question to ask you. Um, your background is that is that your library you work at right now? My what? The library you're at right now, your background, your Zoom background. Well, my Zoom, I don't even know what my Zoom background is. Oh. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see the video. My okay, no, I'm just I'm at home. I don't know what. Anyway, I don't know what picture is showing. <laughs> what picture is showing for me? It, there's a building behind you, but I'm not sure. That's what. Is it um white? With blue accent. Yeah, okay. That's the University of Nigeria. That's the mm -hmm. library. Nam Diaziki, where that's the University of Nigeria, the college library. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna open the floor to all the attendees to ask questions. Well, I have one. This is Anthony. Hi. 
uh, Rufina, uh, this is Anthony. Um, there are, um, you know, the you went to Clark Atlanta, which is probably the most prestigious of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities in the United States. But you were coming from outside of the U.S. And I'm curious if you would uh, have any reflections about the distinctions that you encountered there. Uh, most, almost all of the students, uh, except for perhaps some smaller uh, group of foreign students, were from outside of the U.S. But um, Atlanta Clark is uh, drawing from African American students from all over the country. Yes, and it was it was really a great experience for me going to Clark, and you know, like I stated, the challenges I had, I was new, I had no friends the accent, but, you know, and I, I didn't really, unfortunately, I didn't do much with my fellow students because I didn't live on campus. So in terms of, you know, associating with other students, I didn't really do much of that, but I worked at the library. And like I said, um, the challenges I had with the accent, like, when assisting the faculty and the students, sometimes they will ask me to repeat something or I'll ask them to repeat something. But anyway, um, it was really a great experience going to Clark Atlanta University. We have a, a question in the chat from Phoebe. And she's asking if you can share more about your interest in serving those with special needs within the public libraries. Okay, I tell you, I'm really very passionate about that. When I was a manager at um, the Henry County, the McDonough Public Library, actually because of my passion for serving people with special needs, the library that I managed, we didn't really have special needs people coming in. I had to develop it, and I tell you, when they come in, just because of the passion, how I serve them. First of all, I go, I will Google special needs facilities around me. That's what helped me in identifying where they were all located. Then I went to the facilities and sold the library to them, how they can come into the library. And personally, because of my passion, I didn't assign another staff to do it because when you're helping serving special needs people, you have to have a certain personality or it's not gonna work. So when they will like come in, I'll read stories to them. Their caregiver will tell me the story to read to them. I'll read stories to them. We will play music. We will do different kinds of activities and it really worked out so well that whenever they will come to the library, as soon as they see me, they will start like, they'll be so happy and I'll be so happy anyway. um, Like I said, it's not for everybody. You have to have the passion to serve them because if you don't, they are gonna know and they're not gonna come back. And as a matter of fact, I did a, I did a presentation at one of, um, G Georgia Public Library Service, they had um, a conference just like a week before COVID hit. So I shared all the things, you know, how to serve special needs people, um, how to make it successful. So anyway, anyway, it is just a major passion for me. But unfortunately, right now, because of my position, I'm not really serving them directly. But um, you have to be patient. You have to be somebody that is tolerant. Because you know, sometimes when you're serving them, some of them are not maybe like, let's say paying attention, but I would normally find a way to go to them, get them excited about what I was doing. Anyway, um, I had a really, really great time serving them directly, but right now I'm not doing that anymore. And I miss it. But in your leadership role, you, you're able to 
to advise you, advise those underneath you how to how to aid them and assist them and serve them and yes in the same way that you did so i think that's very beneficial yes exactly as a matter of fact during one of our staff development um trainings i did that i trained staff on how to do it so whenever they will come in i will actually come out of my office and just like kind of you know ginger them up and tell the caregivers how excited we are to have them because when you say things like that they will feel they are not bothering you guys because i'm all for them leaving their facilities because sometimes it becomes um they they will be bored in their facilities so i really love when they come out to the library like sometimes I'll go to their facilities to do programs for them. Like during April, I'll go and read poems to them. You know, yeah. That's amazing. That's a great service that the library provides that you provide um, for your yes. patrons and yes. your community. That's great. Yeah. Is there another um, aspect uh, in the public library that really appeals to you that you just you get up every morning, you're like, I love my job. I talk, okay, I'm the assistant director for customer engagement and community outreach. I love outreach so much that I have made a significant impact at the library that I work for. I've just been with them for just like a year. And I've been out in the public. As a matter of fact, last week, we did a, pod, a podcast you know, if, if we had the opportunity, I would have shared it. But anyway, another one, then three weeks ago, we did a TV showcase where myself and the youth services director, we did a, a TV showcase to talk about the many resources of the library. And I've gone to churches, you know, like after I'm Catholic, so at the end of the mass, I've been to churches where I'll actually be on the pulpit and talk about library services. I have all those on videos and I'm actually sharing all of them with my students so that they can see how to do community outreach, the things you can do to be able to engage with the community. Because one thing, the 21st century library has so much resources that people don't know about. Each time we're talking about brain fuse or we're talking about interplay i don't know if you guys are familiar with interplay interplay is a tr a trade skills program where at the clayton county library we have a partnership with interplay where our patrons can learn how to be hvac technicians plumbers electricians for free through 3d 3D and virtual reality um, simulations. So all of these are things that I go out almost in on a weekly basis to go talk to the community about. And yesterday, for, I, I work for Clayton County government. So for the human resources orientation every month, I go and talk to the new employees about the services of the library. Anyway, I enjoy outreach and it's, it's another passion that I have. Speaking of outreach, um, Samantha has a question. Um, how do you select which organizations to reach out to about library services? It, 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 it's just up to you. It's either schools, like what I'll do is the community organizations around us where a lot of people go to, like churches, I will contact the church to see if we can come out to do a showcase of the library. And most times they're excited. Like I said, for National Library Card Sign Up Month, which was September, I went to a Catholic church on the pulpit. I talked about the library for five minutes. I did that at another church, you know, like I have done countless outreach. It's just a matter of you identifying the community um, organizations around you, schools, recreation centers, churches, 
and things like that. That's great. And how how do you feel like these experiences translate to what you're teaching in, in the classes here at San Jose State? Well, the great thing about somebody like me teaching is that I come with firsthand experience. So pretty much in my classes, either through my lectures or through the videos that I share, or through the discussions, I'm coming with firsthand of experience of over 25 years. So um, it's really working out because I know my students, they are constantly sending emails to me or during my um, evaluation, the feedback from students, they are constantly you know, very appreciative about you know, my teaching style and how I share real life library experience with them. I know a couple couple of our members on the leadership team were excited that we were going to interview you because they had you as a professor and there's nothing but gushed about how great you were, so. That's nice, thank you. <laughs> Did anyone have any other follow-up questions or this additional is Andy comments? Again. I thought I would open it up a little bit. You know, the last time we had our last meeting, we heard a couple of very compelling stories from students who were, who were uh, in fact, the first in their generation to uh, get a professional degree. And we heard stories about people um, uh, challenged economically so that they, they ate a lot of um, very inexpensive food, uh, sometimes we refer to it as the the top ramen diet. We heard stories about uh, students who were either um, proud to go home wearing uh, clothes with the school insignia on them and students who were reluctant to do that because they felt they might get uh, ridiculed at home for showing off that they were going to college where everybody mm -hmm. else wasn't. Um, we heard even stories about um, uh, students who were encouraged by their families not to go to school so they could go shopping and so that they would be a part of their family instead of going mm -hmm. off into this college world. So I'm curious if you've, if you've uh, encountered uh, stories like that in your own classes or uh, what you might have thought about those kinds of stories, students who are venturing further in higher education than their, than their families had. Um, I haven't had that experience, but what you say that resonated with me from my husband's perspective when he's a he's a physical therapist so when he went to medical college of georgia he had we had nothing so he will make um sauces from you know sp spaghetti sauce it will cost him ten dollars to eat for a whole week other students will be going out to dinners and they'll say, oh, you want to join us for dinner? And he will say, oh, I'm not hungry. I mean, they didn't know he had nothing in his pocket. And he was riding a bicycle while other students were riding cars. So anyway, um, it's really tough having challenges, either economically or because you're different. So like I said, the high school to me is doing a fabulous job. And you know, the, the purpose of this is to help the high school to continue doing better. So I think um, getting feedback from the students, interviewing people coming in to see how things can be done for them, because we really want them to be so encouraged where they will tell everyone in their family, you all need to go to college. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that that story about your husband's experience. That was yeah. definitely resonates with a lot of the uh, people in our group. Yeah. All right. Was there anything else, Dr. Ozo, that you'd like to add? this evening? 
Mm, nothing really except that the perspective of first generation that I shared today is really about a foreigner, you know, coming and being the first to go to school in a foreign land. So, you know, basically about the university and libraries being, you know, embracing other cultures through um, bibli bibliographic instruction one-on-one -on -one, um, to students so that you're not doing the instruction to a large group. Because if you're doing the bibliographic instruction for a large group, let's say the high school, if they're having a conference for new students, a large group may not necessarily work for certain people. Because if you do it that way, they may not really benefit. All of our students who are going to be graduating and going to work, in, especially in large cities, are going to encounter people in their service populations who are in a very similar way new to the country. Yes. Um, either from Asia or from Latin America or from Africa or from Europe. Mm -hmm. and so hearing your story about that is, a, is an important way to be considering that, um, if not for their own family experience, then the experiences of a lot of the people they'll be serving in the future. Exactly. Um, and it's not an easy thing to just go somewhere else and start a whole <laughs> new life. Exactly. It's true. I mean, uh, for my classes, I share a guest speaker session of me and another librarian who is from, incidentally, from Nigeria. So we basically talked about the importance of diversity and inclusion. And, you know, I think there are actually quite a few members in our group who, like, they might not have come here alone, like they came with their parents, but they're still the first ones in their family to go to school in North America. So I yes. think, I mean, obviously they have the advantage of having um, their parents and the rest of their family here with them, but they're still going through that experience of, of they're, they're the first one to do school here. Um, so I think your experience, it can resonate with probably a lot of our members in that way. Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, kudos to the high school, but I, like I said, you guys are doing this just for the school to be better. And, you know, we really appreciate that. We appreciate you. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, was there anything else that anybody wanted to throw in there just before we close up? Oh, there's something in the chat. Let me see. Rosa oh, said thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Oza. It's it's been wonderful and thank you for sharing your story. And we really appreciate you taking time with us this evening. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And please let me know anytime you need me to come speak about, you know, this or about or about outreach or special needs, you know, I'll be happy to. Oh, thank you so I much. I appreciate that offer. Yeah, okay. very much so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night. All right, good night. I was just going to leave this up in case anybody wanted to join. We have a new Slack channel, and we're also going to be having our uh, coffee and chat next month on April 20th at 6.30, and we hope to see you there. Thank you all very much for attending. All right. But the Slack channel. Phoebe, you can use whatever email you'd like. Um, if you'd like to join, um, you can go ahead and drop whatever email you'd want to use in the um, chat box, and I'll get you added to the Slack channel right away. Um, it's totally up to you what you'd like to use. Perfect. I'll make a note of that, and I will add you soon as we're finished here. If I can, does somebody have a pen? I don't have a pen. <laughs> I do. I'll get that okay. right now. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> All right.
Thank you, Phoebe. I just don't want to exit out until we have it written yeah. down because the chat, I, I can't save. <laughs> oh, I'm going to stop the room.